Welcome to MindShift. I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode that I'm very eager to get to as it has been maybe one of the biggest issues I've had with Christianity the longest. But before I do, I wanted to give a quick plug to please turn on notifications and or subscribe if you have not yet. Sometimes I'll put out a video on a Saturday that many of you just are not aware of because you don't have notifications on. And I also check the stats and I'm seeing a lot of views coming from non-subscribed members, which is great. It means we're reaching new people. But I'd love if you have seen this channel more than once and you enjoy what I do here would you please think about joining the family? All right, enough of that. Let's talk about the issue I have for today's video. It's an issue that bugged me even as a child. And even though I held on for decades to this religion, it was probably one of the ones that was most always in the back of my mind that I had just shelved aside to not have to deal with. And that is why did this particular God only reveal himself to one group of people in one time frame? The issues that arise from this are so obvious to most of us, and yet believers seem to somehow maintain that this is not problematic. So I want to point out today why it's problematic. I want to go through some of the theological and philosophical issues that arise from a God that would act this way. And I also want to give you some real world perspective on all of the different people groups that existed before Yahweh ever showed up, even when Yahweh was showing up in his one little part of the world, the people groups that were alive during that time? Or what about when Jesus was walking around preaching and teaching to this same small local region? What else was going on in the world then? And what's going on in the world right now where we still have groups that haven't even had a chance to hear about this religion? So hopefully you'll be learning a little bit, if nothing else today, about some of the other people groups that have shared our planet. But hopefully I can also help you think along the lines of how man-made this clearly is when we have a perfect God of all creation that seems to only be concerned with this tiny little area and also for a very short period of human history. So let's talk about the history here. Let's talk about our time frames. There are Christians that believe in evolution and they believe with all of the scientific numbers that we have our best guesses at, like the earth being roughly 4 billion years old, the history of this universe going back to, we can see about 13.8 billion years. And they have found a way to mix that, not just with a God, but even the Christian God. Now, I think that's very problematic. I understand deism in general, agreeing with evolution. I think that Christianity agreeing with evolution is not completely mutually exclusive, but I think that it's close. So there are people out there that are on board with how old this earth is, but that means just briefly to cover their position that at some point along the evolutionary change, this God would have endowed one group of primates with souls and not the others. And at one point, time, meaning that in this scenario, there would be primate parents that did not have a soul, that were not to be judged, and then their children, something changed dramatically enough where that's where God is going to imbue the soul and eternal judgment. I think it's incredibly problematic. And then you have the creation story. Now, if we follow the biblical numbers that even Christians cannot agree on, we get a starting date somewhere between 4000 BCE and 5500 BCE. So those are some of the dates that we're going to use. Then we know that Jesus was on the scene roughly 30 years before we go from BCE to CE. So these are our numbers that I want to work on today. Let's go through what some of the obvious issues are, and then I'm just going to show you these different people groups, and hopefully that is of interest to you. But the first issue, the most obvious, say it with me now, it's unfair, period. When the only way that you can get right with your maker which the claim is that Yahweh made everyone. Even though many of us are learning through my Dissecting the Divine series that Yahweh was just once part of this pantheon of Canaanite gods, a son of Ael, one of the 70 sons, who got dominion over a particular people group, the Jewish people, and that actually makes a whole lot more sense. But the claim from most believers today is that Yahweh is the one and only God, that he created everything, the entire universe, every single solar system, including this one with our eight planets. He picked the third one from the sun and said, that's where I'm going to make life. This is what it's all about. And then he zoomed all the way in and he picked a spot between two rivers in the Middle East. And he said, this is where I'm going to reveal myself. And I'll do so somewhere around 5,500 BCE to 4,000 BCE, completely ignoring 
everyone that ever existed before then, that even for Christians that don't believe in evolution, there's simply no denying that we had people groups around building things, doing things, learning things, believing in things well before the year 5500 BCE. He did that for a few hundred years, disappeared, came back as a new person, as a man this time for 33 years, and then came back for 40 days and then disappeared for forever, taking up about 3% of the total global land mass in terms of where this God supposedly was visited or showed up, potentially even less, depending how you do the math. Un- fair, especially when you need this God to inherit eternal life in a paradise and avoid one of two conditions, again, since Christians can't agree, either being completely annihilated or some sliding scale of, well, maybe you have to be, you know, burned off and you still have to pay some debts and then you're annihilated or all the way just with hell, tortured forever, no mercy, no end. So I think it's kind of a big deal that if God is judging everyone out there like this, shouldn't everyone have the same option initially to see God, to be able to believe in him that easily? I mean, think about his patriarchs. Think about what this God had to do to get the ball rolling on his religion, physically walking around with Adam in the garden. Even after he kicks them out, we have reports that he and his angels are teaching them how to live, how to sow, how to cook. He's talking directly with Noah before before he decides to start over again. He's walking with Abraham after the flood. He's showing up physically as he leads his people out of slavery. He's dwelling with them as he helps them commit atrocity after atrocity to bring them into a land that wasn't theirs, but that he promised to them. And then he sticks around a few hundred more years, judging them, sending them prophets, killing them off, allowing them to be in exile, and then delivers them back to their land. Not that that goes very smoothly, disappears for a very long time as that world is thrown into pure and utter chaos. And then he sends his son. And Jesus, for being the son of the God that created the whole earth, who was there at creation, seems to have no interest in going anywhere past what his feet will carry him for a day or crossing a big lake on a boat. Also, that means we need to believe it was in God's plan to have Jesus die at age 33. Wouldn't it have been amazing if that happened at 70 and we had 37 more years of the Son of God walking around, healing, teaching, making sure that everyone had an opportunity, you know, heading over to India and China, up into Russia. I'm sure God could have worked out a way for him to get to the Americas. But no, God chose the timing for all of this is what we are to believe. You know, before there was good historical records, at least with the people group he chose to show up to. It started as complete oral tradition. Maybe smack dab in the middle of Rome would have been a good time to do this. Maybe once we got the internet or video cameras, how very convenient that this God shows up to people who can't properly record it or make good evidence for it. And only to these people that would make these claims against, by the way, the claims of everyone else making the same kind of assertion. Oh, we have a God too. We have a creator too. Here's what ours did for us. Here's his powers. What's yours like? Mm, we believe there can be multiples. Nope. We believe there can only be one. Oh, we probably have the same God. You just call your something different. And the confusion, the war, the death, the slavery, the hate, the bigotry. Think about everything that came from having a God who is supposed to be the God of everyone that holds everyone to the same standards that only works through one group of people for only a little bit of time. Unfair. We could go on forever on this point. And really, it's what leads and leaks down into every single other issue. And I'm seeing so many excuses and so many things that could come up. Well, don't worry, you know, God made general revelation. People know about this God and they're saved by this God just by recognizing him in his creation. The problems in general with general revelation are enormous. And here's a video where I cover some of it. Same thing with the age of accountability. These things are not clearly spelled out in the Bible. They're things that Christians have had to make up essentially after the fact by really loose associated verses as the only way to explain how it's not utterly pure evil to have children that die or individuals that die before having a chance to know about this God. Oh, well, if they didn't really get the chance to know, they never heard the name of Jesus, they at least could have it revealed to them through creation. But then we have other verses that literally say the only way to the Father is through the name of Jesus. We are told that the only way to love this God is to know him and obey him. That's pretty hard if you're stuck across an ocean on an entire continent that hasn't even been discovered or even known about by the people that are conceiving and making up this God in the first place. But if that's your excuse, general revelation, then the biggest horror that the Christian ever did 
was the missionary journey. The second that you set out and you say the name of Jesus in front of someone, you have now made them capable of receiving a life of eternal suffering. If you really believed that, you wouldn't go anywhere, except that's at direct odds with the Great Commission. So I get it. You're between a rock and a hard place. Once again, unfair. And really, this was my first thought. I, I was super into Native American history uh, from a very young age. It's a culture that I love and I love learning about. And the very first time that it ever dawned on me, again, very young, they never even had the chance to hear until it was white men coming to take their land who were essentially aliens. I mean, really, better technology, dressed completely different, different skin colors, different languages, different gods, and somewhere between trying to save them and eradicate them and get them out of the way because their very existence was an issue to the manifest destiny of these individuals, we converted the ones we didn't kill off, or at least tried to. But again, millennia after the fact. What does that say about every single Native American that died before the right white men built big enough boats to bring over disease, death, and a Bible? Theologically speaking, they're burning in hell. Again, unless you count all of this very creative general revelation, which I have heard of so many people groups being contacted for the first time. And do you know what none of them ever said? the name of Jesus. It doesn't cry out from creation, despite what any Christian believes. No one comes out with the same story. Oh, it's Yahweh. He has a son. He's a trinity in three persons. We owe him a debt because of my great ancestor, Adam, apparently. And the only way I can pay that debt is through perfection, which I can't do, which means I have to use the blood magic of his son. No one comes out understanding that just from observing creation, being in awe of the butterfly or the ant or the leaf or whatever. How utterly ridiculous that Christians have soothed the very obvious pain point that is the unfairness of this God having a chosen people, which leads us to point three as we describe all of this, which is the bigotry and racism that is obviously going to become an issue when for the first few hundred years that this people group exists, they say this is our God. He's only for us. If you oppose us, you oppose him. Give me your land or else. See my Gentiles made them just to hate them video to understand God's initial plan for the entire world. Just could not have cared less about anyone that wasn't his chosen people. Only via Paul making excuses after the fact and speaking on God's behalf that he tried to make the Jews jealous by opening up salvation to the rest of us, did we have a chance at getting grafted in. And even then, as we go through these different people groups, you're going to see how many of them never, ever had a chance. But setting this up for the nicest words are the racism and the bigotry, because what it's going to lead to is holy war and genocide. And no, it's not the only religion that has had this effect, but it's still an effect. And by the way, the main other one is also an Abrahamic religion. Being a perfect, all-loving creator of the entire universe and allowing a couple countries in the Middle East to fight over what your proper name is or who's entitled to this holy land, etc., knowing that that's going to be going on for millennia, this God still chose to show up exactly how he did, to exactly who he did, exactly when he did, thinking that this is the right way to do it. It is so obvious that this is just what happened in history, and we're looking back and trying to explain it. No good, all-powerful, all-knowing God in their right mind would ever attempt anything like this. Before I get into the people groups here, imagine with me for just a moment, really, what you would expect. Try to be five again. Try to be learning about this God for the very first time. Try not to know everything that you happen to know about the history of the world and the apologetics for all of the issues with the Bible. What would you expect a God who made everything to do? Maybe, maybe reveal himself to everything, to everyone at the same time? If you had 10 kids at the same time, bam, now you have 10 children. In what world would you take two of them and reveal yourself to just two out of the eight? The other eight, you have sent off, they're lost. They're wandering around, they're making up parents because they don't have any. They're all making up different claims about what their parents were like. They're running around, they're killing each other, they're dying, and you're gonna punish them, by the way, for dying without knowing you, even though it's 100% your fault. And then the two that you take, you're gonna reveal yourself to 
at different times, in different ways, with different scriptures. This can represent whatever you want. I don't care if it's Islam versus Christianity or Catholics versus Protestants, whatever. This just shows the division that comes from two of the children who actually still had access to the parent, but the parent is purposely giving different information at different times among them. They will hate each other. They will fight with each other. They will tear each other down in the name of us, the parent, by the way. And I will step back and watch and accept, and then I'll completely disappear. If a parent did that with their 10 children, what would you think about them? Would the words perfect and loving ever, ever come into the vocabulary? Or would you say unfair, evil, neglectful, harm-inducing, even hateful. Of course you would. So why do we make an exception for this God who had all the cards, who had all the power, who had all the knowledge? The only way to accept this God, if you can accept him at all, knowing the facts about this God, are that he is indeed not all good, that he can't possibly know everything, that he's not all powerful, and if he is, he's just evil then. This is a God who has ignored the vast amount of people he's ever made. So let's get into some of those examples. I want to talk first about groups that we know exist existed before 5500 BCE. So if you're a believer who believes in creation, if you believe counting backwards from the generations that are in the Bible, even if you believe Adam and Eve are somehow metaphorical or Genesis is more allegorical, whatever, you believe there's a beginning, you believe this God showed up on the scene, here's when he starts revealing himself to his patriarchs and to his prophets. The furthest back you can really get is 5500 BCE. So here's a few groups before that. Let's even start in the very same place. So this would be where now we have Jordan and Israel and Palestine. There was a group here between 12,000 and 9,500 BCE. You know, just 7,000 years before this God claims to be making the first man between these rivers. They were the Natfian people. They were one of the earliest to transition from the very nomadic lifestyle to any kind of settling down, utilizing agriculture and laying the way for these future communities that would turn into the Canaanite peoples and the pantheon of their gods, etc. Five to seven thousand years before. And here they are just doing their thing, surviving, eating, making up myths and stories, utilizing fire and tools. Does it give some perspective? It really does to me. How about just a few thousand years before our 5500 BCE start date, we get the Catahoyic people, which would be in modern day Turkey, roughly. One of the world's earliest known Neolithic civilizations. We see animal husbandry. We see early agriculture and intricate murals and mud brick houses densely, densely packed. As you learn about world and religious history, it gets to a point where it is just so ridiculous to just boop, hop into the middle of history, not the beginning of history, and grab one little local culture's one particular God that they worshiped and call him everything, the most high, the creator of the universe. It's insanity, really. At this exact same time period between 5500 and 7500 BCE, we can move over to ancient China. Right by the Yellow Sea, we had a civilization, the Jiahu. They're known for possibly having the earliest working musical instruments. 2000 years before Yahweh comes and creates Adam and Eve, we have people over in China sitting next to the Yellow River plain music. Amazing. Going back to the Nat Fuin period, how about Jericho itself? People always get so excited because we know Jericho existed. And so since it's mentioned in the Bible, people are like, see, the Bible's accurate, which no one has ever said everything in the Bible is inaccurate, just a lot of things. Getting a few dates and places right, especially of major cities that existed about three to 4,000 years before the Bible even says civilization began, Jericho was most likely standing around 9,000 BCE. And if you're curious how we know about these dates, I remember being a young earth Christian who was hearing claims like this and was like, based off what? Like, oh, carbon dating, that only works. And you, you get some of these same talking points and you become so stupid, essentially. There's so many different and good ways that we can know these things. And I'm not going to be able to talk about them in this video, but I think we'll make a video soon on just how we know what we claim to know that then does refute the things that are claimed in the Bible, because that can be a big barrier of entry for many people. I understand that. But please just know there's no conspiracy of scientists to hide and manipulate evidence and create dating and things because everyone's working for the devil and going against Christ. Like It's insane what many Christians will believe about just 
good old natural science, history, archaeology, etc. And by the way, of course, we could be going down into deeper Africa or over to the Americas. There was civilization going on everywhere around our world at this time. But I think for this particular example, it's even neater to see the ones that pre-existed in the same location before the dates where Yahweh showed up. So let me give you a fifth one and we'll move on to our next grouping. Megar, which would have been one of the earliest Neolithic civilizations in the Indus Valley, so close to probably modern day Pakistan, existed around 7,000 BCE all the way up through the same time of the Israelites. It ended around 2,600 BCE. So these people living not all too far away from the Israelites, probably doing some trade along some of the same routes eventually, existed 1,500 years before our creation story takes off. So those are five that existed before. Let's look at a few that existed during. So sometime between 5,500 BCE and zero. Well, and I won't even count this one as a point, but a lot of the places that get mentioned in the Bible existed before before, during, and in some cases after many of the events that are listed in the Bible. This would be like ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia. We have myths from both of these great places that predate any of the Jewish or Israelite myths, but then they're around during that same time and even in a pretty close location. And when convenient for God, sometimes he wants those people to worship him. Like when he does the 10 plagues, he tells Moses ahead of time it's going to be so that the people of Egypt can see his power and follow him. That doesn't happen. Or like the story we just covered in Secular Bible Study with Jonah going to Nineveh. That was kind of God stepping out of his chosen people group for one quick moment, even though it most likely never happened and was just a satirical tale for prophets on what they better not do and be like. We never saw any citywide conversion for the great trading city of Nineveh. How about ancient India? India was actually one of the first places to get a missionary, probably within the first or second century. But during this period, they're completely isolated and on their own. What about the Mesoamericans, the Olmec, the Maya, the Aztec? Some of them were around during this exact period across the ocean with no possible way to conceive of the Yahweh character. No idea about some magical fruit from some magical tree being eaten by the first two people after a magical serpent talked to them that would lead to these people owing a debt to a God they don't even know about. And of course, there were cultures in Mesoamerica that predate this myth, but they were also living right alongside. But a God that is already so challenged to go in any direction more than, say, 30 or 40 miles definitely wasn't going to be able to figure out how to get over to Mesoamerica until people on their own, with their technology, their ideas, their advancements, figured out how to get over there, or that there was an over there. Information that at no time was privy to any of these amazing prophets with all of their knowledge of the future, they never saw across the ocean. No clue whatsoever. So instead of weirdly twisting the fact that Jericho was a real place and also found in your Bible as proof for the Bible, can you just imagine if one of these prophets had said, hey, Go 4,000 miles that way. You'll run into a culture that does this, looks like that around this time. But no, none of them ever knew anything more than what people of their time and place knew in that time and place. Isn't that amazing? What about the Andean civilizations? These are separate than the Almecs and the Mayans. These people were absolutely dominating during this time. Agricultural terracing, huge monuments, worshiping their own sun gods like Inti. Over in ancient Japan, if we just want to pick somewhere random, you have two people groups during this time, with the emergence of the Jamon and the Yeoyi. I'm sure I'm totally mispronouncing those, as many of these, by the way. But these two groups have come along and are doing agriculture and making pottery and are characterized by many of their own societal developments. Imagine the tradition and the culture going on in Japan at the same time and how completely foreign it would seem to someone like Moses or Joshua or King David. Not on their radar. At this same time, not too far from them, all things considered globally speaking, we have all the ancient Celtic societies spread across Europe, kind of a tribal nature of their own, amazing craftsmanship, and all of their own religion, if you will, based on nature, nature deities, druidism, etc. Wouldn't it have been something if they were revealed Yahweh? And there's so many places that we've missed. I mean, think about people in southern Africa, think about people up in northern Russia, or all the way down in 
in Indonesia, New Zealand, Australia. I mean, the Aboriginal peoples of Australia were alive in Thumpin long before 5500 BCE, but also during this time, they are still there passing down their myths and their traditions, completely isolated. And as we made contact with them eventually, None of them said to us anything about Jesus or Yahweh. They had nature all around them. They worshiped their own nature gods. And yet it wasn't self-evident to them who the creator of this universe was just by his creation. So that was another group of five, I think, during the time of kind of Yahweh as he's down. Now, remember, Yahweh's so active during this time. He's literally a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, sitting in the Holy of Holies with his feet up on the Ark of the Covenant while he sits on a throne of cherubs. Like, that's where this God is. He is with his people. He is meeting them on mountaintops. He is planning divine long-term plans for which tribe is going to defeat which and who's going to get who back for judgment and what people get to go into what land at what time and how long they're going to get to stay there. And it's all so little. It's all so myopic. It's all so obviously man-made and narrow when you zoom out and you consider the rest of what is going on. And then, after a long stint of being quiet himself, Yahweh gives birth to himself in the form of Jesus, who was also always there from the very beginning, with some very strange middle ground between still God, but also a man. Sometimes having magic power, sometimes knowing things he's not supposed to know, but other times being limited. And despite any of his understanding or how brilliant he was for the Son of God, Jesus made no reference, no idea that anything else was going on anywhere else in the world. Jesus knew so little of this world that any fifth grader and the internet has him completely beat. But just for fun, here's a few groups that were alive and kicking that Jesus had no intention of going and performing miracles to, that didn't need them to know about his death and resurrection. So the first that we'll talk about is the Han Dynasty. When Jesus is walking around and making extra fish and loaves for everyone, the Han Dynasty was right in the middle of their 400 year reign, mainly from 200 BCE to 200 CE roughly speaking. So Jesus comes and dies in the middle of it, and it doesn't affect them at all. We have the Moira Empire in ancient India at this time. Pretty close. It's budding up right before Jesus was born. They were big on spreading their culture and their religions along the Silk Road, but Jesus never took a road to them. Just leave India to do their thing. So, so far, he's just neglected China and India. I wonder if he'll go south down at all, maybe even just a little bit into northern Africa. Well, not if you ask the Garamantes, who would not have heard of Jesus, even though they lived in northern Africa near the Sahara Desert. I guess they would have been pretty close to modern-day Libya now. They controlled a ton of trade routes. They were part of the Berber people. Just a whole lot going on on their own with absolutely no influence from Jesus the Christ. Once again, we could hop back down to Mesoamerica where things are getting even closer and we're starting to break off into some smaller tribes that'll be populating Mexico and up through the Americas. Native Americans essentially everywhere, fighting with each other, trading with each other, worshiping gods, having their own creation myths, Pahasapa, the heart of everything that is, up in the Black Hills, their very own Garden of Eden, completely ignorant of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And as Jesus walked around preaching that the end is near, he couldn't even conceive of these people. We have the Parthenian Empire in ancient Persia that would have been during the time of Jesus. It's conceivable that he would have known of them or they might have known of people in his region, but he wasn't making any missionary trips there on his own. And they were pretty busy fighting the Romans. They were very skilled horsemen and archers. They had a lot going on and none of them stopped to make a trip to Jesus's manger to offer anything to this king of the Jews. And why would they? And I'm pretty sure that that's five, but just in case, we'll add the Russians for this one. Way, way out east and north, we get some of the steppe tribes in Mongolia and Russia, groups that lived completely on horseback in the dead of winter, that experienced winters like Jesus would have never even known existed, yet 
He was the creator of them. He was there when God was bragging to Job about how he stores up the snow and the hail in special storehouses because that's how weather works. It's also a good time to point out, I just think it's fascinating, like on this tiny little planet, so tiny, God could have waited just a little bit longer and we would have had more paved roads to more people, better modes of transportation that Jesus could have taken if he came centuries or millennia later, ways of evidence and proof where it would have been all too clear that this was the Son of God. He really came, he really died, he really raised from the dead, and he really did so for everybody. Who can believe those things? And what if, and this is a pretty good assumption, there's other life out there. I know this is hard for some Christians, but if you really understand how big the universe is, it's kind of just a probability issue. Think about the issues that would arise for them when just Earth is the one that knows about Jesus Christ. It's the exact same issues with having people in the Americas and having a chosen people group in the Middle East. They might as well have been on the other side of the universe because this God came when there was that big of a delta with travel and world mapping and culture and understanding. God chose this. This is how he wanted to reveal himself. And still today, this is another section I want to cover really quick. We have groups of people that have most likely, even though they've been contacted maybe once, maybe twice, not had a chance to actually know about this God. Still today. And they're on Earth. I'm not talking about all the ones on the planets that support life that we don't know about, we'll never know about, we'll never communicate with. They will come into existence and poof out of existence on time frames that we can't even understand, and none of them will have conceived of the word Yahweh, because it's something that one tiny little people group came up with on earth in one given place in time. Really, inexcusable is the only word I can think of. The Sentinelese of North Sentinel Island are a very private people group, extremely limited contact over in the Indian Ocean with a lot of hostility towards outsiders that have essentially allowed them to be left alone. What an ineffective God that for thousands of years now since he decided to reveal himself, there are still people groups where if you're born there, you're simply screwed, theologically speaking. We have the indigenous Yananami tribes down by the Amazon, the Jarawara people on the Andaman Islands over again it by the Indian Ocean, the tribes of the Papua New Guinea Highlands, and the Tostin or the Duca, which some of you might be familiar with because they are the reindeer tribes up in northern Mongolia. There's five, and that's not even all of them, of people spread out all over the world that have been essentially uncontacted or unchanged. This God sure doesn't mind so many different people not even having a chance to know him. By the way, one part that I was going to make this video and I kind of switched from is I was going to show all of the times that this particular God punished his particular people for worshiping other gods, right? Even the story of Jonah that looks so good where God is going after the people of Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left is what is said about them, meaning how wicked they are. They were worshiping a whole host of different gods because there were so many different people groups living in Nineveh since it was such a large trading city. You finally have God sending a prophet to them. Why? To get them to repent of their wicked ways and their false gods before what? He would destroy them. And he gave them 40 days. So knowing that, I want to understand how clearly, depending on some of these different groups, they've been around tens of thousands of years, and this God just doesn't care at all. No warning for them, no prophets, no destruction. We still have the aboriginals down in Australia doing their thing, worshiping their false gods. We still have native people here in the Americas worshiping false gods. We still have these unreached people groups that I just mentioned worshiping false gods. The entire time in Mesoamerica that they went through all of their different dynasties or all of the different dynasties in China or Japan or India, all of these different communities and cultures and all of the false religions that have been allowed to go on for century after century century after century, millennia after millennia after millennia after millennia after millennia after millennia, like we are talking thousands of years at the smallest, if we're not even getting into the evolutionary history of how many times sapiens have been around and once they kind of conceived of something higher than themselves or buried their dead, like this goes so far back and God's fine with it because he didn't know about it, because he only knew about the local places, because he doesn't exist, because he's just something that these people made up. If they had known about these places, they'd be talking about these places. They'd be talking about how these places owe their God the same debt they do, how God is going to punish them. There should have been a prophet that was afraid to go to the Americas, like how there was a prophet afraid to go to Nineveh, but that didn't happen. It's so clearly 
man-made. And the last thing I want to share with you, I just pulled up and compiled some different stats here that I wanted to share. This is when some of these countries first had the chance to hear about Christianity. So Russia didn't get missionaries until the ninth century. There's not even an ocean between Russia and the Middle East. Nine centuries, 900 years of people being born and dying, born and and dying without getting to hear about the good news of the gospel message. China was first reached somewhere between the 7th and 10th century CE. India, as I mentioned, was one of the first, maybe even in the first century AD, the apostle Thomas maybe got to India. Good job, Thomas. Of course, we know South America would have been sometime after Columbus, so the 1500s. Not, by the way, like all of this was just fun when these Christians showed up and they converted people just off the saving nature and the love of Christ and the good deeds that they did. Nope, usually at the tip of the sword. North America, of course, was more the 16th century. Australia wasn't until the 18th century. Even South Africa, who cared about going all the way down there? We're talking the 17th century before the Dutch and British colonizers got down there. Even the British Isles, not too far, even with everything that was going on with Rome, not to the third and fourth century. And it goes on. And obviously there's so many people groups that I did not mention. There are so many parts of the planet. There are so many people. It's, it's not taken into account all of the people, the billions of people that have been born and died absolutely outside the sight line or the care line of this perfect, loving creator of everything and everyone. There's no excuses for it. I mean, there's excuses. There's apologetics. And I can't wait to hear the Christians on this comment. Here's what you're going to hear. You're going to get more cops of general revelation. You're going to get it put back on us, by the way. That's why God has the Great Commission. It's on us. We are the reason these people are being born and dying and going to hell. That sounds like an awful plan from God. You wouldn't like it if you were just born somewhere else and the only true God was Yahweh and the only way that he was going to let you know about his special little plan for salvation and the only way to avoid the horror of hell is for one of his believers to be a good missionary, come to you, find you, and somehow convince you that everything you've grown up learning from your culture, from everyone that's like you and thinks like you and your indoctrination process, that you're wrong. That's the great plan to save people. How ineffective, how stupid. Stupid. And again, it is. It's like a checklist that these Christians can say, oh, well, we tried. We took Bibles here. We translated the word into that country. Now they're on their own, as if that makes up for God placing them in a time and place where I guess they were lucky enough to finally get a translated version of some foreigner's version of God that has to go completely against everything they've been taught themselves. Like, if you're really a good God who desires, as God says he desires, for none to be lost, this cannot be your plan. This cannot be your best idea. How inept. And yet this is the state of the world. We know this. We understand when all these people were reached and not in a way for them to all be able to receive it. God planned from the beginning then for most people to fail. He is not worthy of worship. If this God is real, he is an utter failure unless he succeeded at being evil or he doesn't exist. Pick between those three. There is no third option. He either does not exist, he does and he's evil, or he does and he is stupid. You don't get the God that you think you have with these facts. You just don't. And that's it. That's all I have to say. I'm going to finally shut up. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you have an excellent rest of your Sunday. I'll see you Tuesday for another takedown. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my Iconoclist and GBI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you simply enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.